The Word of Faith Netcast is on the air. Well, praise God. This is the Word of Faith Netcast, and this is Dr. Bill Bailey. I'm glad you could join us this week. We're going to get into the Word of God with a topic, really, that we've already talked about to a certain extent. But uh, we recently, when I say we, I recently taught at Faith and Victory Church in Greensburg, North Carolina, and taught on the topic, you got to get out of the boat. And so I want to go into that service because sometimes when you're in a service like that, and it's, it's a live service, uh, you get into a lot more than you do when you're just teaching, you know, into a camera like we have here. So, let's go into that service already in progress. Amen. I'm focused on the Word, praise the Lord. And that's the way I like it. Alrighty. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Pastor's been talking about the life and teachings of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus and His earthly ministry. We're going to take a, a little chapter of uh, a slice of his earthly ministry and look at it today. And uh, I just believe the Lord's got a couple of really important points to make through this. For those in the audio room that are looking for a title, I always love to give you a title. This is you got to get out of the boat. <laughs> Amen. you got to get out of the boat. We'll find out why that's important here in a bit. Let's start in verse 14, Matthew 14, 14. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Now, Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those who were pressed to the devil. A couple of important things we can see from that. Sickness and disease is depression of the devil. Amen. Healing is good. Now, I grew up Southern Baptist, praise the Lord. And the Southern Baptist, bless their hearts, they knew all about salvation. Now, I tell you what, we heard salvation messages every single Sunday morning. You couldn't come to that church and not get saved. I mean, I mean, if nothing else, you just hear enough to get saved just, just being there, even if you didn't pay attention. You know. So we knew about salvation, but when it came to speaking in tongues, baptism of the Holy Ghost, healing... Uh, no, they didn't want to have anything to do with that. And I heard some of my Baptist brethren tell me once I got involved, you know, in that slippery creek bank that Pastor H Brother Hagen talks about, where you slide in, if you hang around uh, Pentecostal folks too long, uh, charismatic folks too long, then you'll just slide down that creek bank. Well, I slid in pretty quick. It was a very slippery creek bank. I was in there. And so uh, I started talking about baptism of the Holy Ghost. I started talking about speaking in other tongues. I started talking about healing. And I had a bunch of well-meaning Baptist brethren come up and say, Now, Brother Bill, that's of the devil. And I said, Healing is of the devil? Oh, yes, yes. I said, Well, now explain to me how healing is of the devil since it's good. I mean, if I'm sick and I get healed, that's good. Well, he has a, a, a mysterious purpose in making you uh, well because, you know, it just... There goes the sacred cow back there, just fell over. You know, and they explain all these things, and none of it made sense. I mean, I was just a, I was a high school kid. I didn't know, you know. I'm like, why is sickness good and healing is bad? Well, it turns out, guess what? They were wrong. <laughs> and we've got scripture that's plain that we can show them. Jesus went about doing good and healing. So. Doing good involves healing. Healing involves doing good. I think if you went to the hospital that I work at, High Point Regional, and you ask any doctor working there, is what you're doing good? They go, well, yeah. I mean, duh, common sense, you know, doing good, healing. Well, that's what Jesus was doing. He was doing it anointed by the Holy Ghost. Now, here's an important point that really is specific to what we're talking about here today. And that is, Jesus, when he was in his earthly ministry, he didn't minister as the Son of God, the you know, a, a person who's part of the Godhead. Now, he was the Son of God, and he was part of the Godhead, but he laid all that aside 
before he came to earth in his earthly ministry. It says he laid all of that aside, and literally he was ministering as effectively an Old Testament prophet in his earthly ministry. He called himself a prophet and a teacher when it talks about how he addressed himself in his earthly ministry. So he went about uh, preaching, teaching, and healing. That was his ministry. All of that he did as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost. Now, if you understand that, it'll help you understand some of the things that he did. For instance, it'll help you understand when he went to his own hometown and he got there and there were sick there. It says he could there do no mighty work, save or accept that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and actually the Greek says a few sick with minor ailments, uh, and healed them. But he could there. It doesn't, didn't say he didn't want to. didn't say he wouldn't do it. It says he could there do or couldn't do a mighty work. Well, why? Because he was operating as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost, and those people's faith and their receptivity to faith was involved. If he just came on the scene as the Son of God, you know, I'm God, boom, and they got healed, well, that'd be one thing. It wouldn't matter what they thought, what they believed, what condition they were in as far as, you know, how they believed about Jesus and his earthly ministry. But because they doubted his ability, they doubted who he was, they said, this guy's just the son of a carpenter. I mean, who's he? We know him. We grew up with him. So they doubted his right to use the power of God. Yet they'd heard, you know, that he'd done all these things all over the place except there. So it was, it was really a key thing that they weren't operating in faith, weren't even really receptive. All they need to do is be receptive, you know. But uh, they, they weren't. And so he could there do no mighty work. So here, though, it says that there was a great multitude there. He was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Now, apparently that took a while because there was a multitude. But it says when it was evening, so it's the end of the day here, the disciples came, this is verse 15, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. Don't you love King James? Hallelujah. Victuals. Now, if that was Granny Clappett, she'd say vittles. That's where that word vittles comes from, is victuals. It's just food. So they can go buy themselves some food. And Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And the disciples said unto him, Well, we don't have anything but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and his pastor points out they weren't bigger in those days. <laughs> All right? It's just plain old five loaves and two fishes. And he looked up to heaven, he blessed, he broke, and he gave the loaves, I love this, to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And the reason I bring this out is this is the helps ministry in action. Notice that the minister, Jesus, he broke the bread and gave it to the helps ministry. The helps ministry gave it to the multitude. Now, what's cool about that is that means that the, the disciples there, the, the, uh, uh, the 12, were, in, were involved in the miracle. All right, they were passing that food out, and as the food went through their hands, it's multiplying too. They took part in the anointing that was present to meet this need supernaturally. Now, in the same way, those of us here at Faith and Victory Church, as we minister in the helps ministry, we take part in the anointing that's on Pastor Ed, and that flows through us and operates through us. So there's a tremendous teaching involving the helps ministry involved just in this right here, where he gave the loaves to the disciples, the disciples to the multitude. And we'll find out a little bit more about that as we go on. And they did all eat and were filled, kind of implies they had more than one, you know, helping, right? <laughs> you know, hey, I'll take some more fish over here. You know? So they were filled. They ate until they were completely filled. Um, and uh, they did all eat, were filled, and took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. Now, again, 12 baskets, 12 disciples. Each one had a basket. Each one's handing out the food. Now they're going around picking up the food that's left over. Each disciple's got the basket, and guess what? 
They had baskets full. Now they started out with a little boy's lunch. <laughs> now they got a basket, baskets and baskets full, 12 of them. So there's no doubt that this was a supernatural miracle of provision. God meeting the needs of the people. All right? Uh, and the, the disciples once again were involved in taking it up and putting in these baskets. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. You know, well, as pastors pointed out before, if you just average that out and say, well, okay, there's probably one woman to a man, most likely, they came as a family, and there's at least one child per family. In those days, guaranteed, there's a whole lot more than one per family. <laughs> but just, you know, casually speaking, probably more like 15,000 people or more involved here. And they all ate and were filled. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship, into a ship, and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he sends them as an advanced team. He says, go ahead, get in the ship, go across the, the sea, and I'll join you. Meanwhile, I'm going to finish ministering to the folks here and dismiss them. So they go on ahead. Now Jesus did that for a reason. He had a plan, and that is he wanted to go up to the mountain and, and pray. He wanted to take time and pray, like we were talking about taking time to pray for these Bruce and Cindy Black meetings. There is benefit in taking time, setting time apart, and praying. And so that's what Jesus did. It says, when he sent the multitudes away, verse 23, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst, midst means middle, so it was out in the middle of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Once again, I love King James. The wind was contrary. There was a storm. <laughs> I mean, this was a rough situation. And these men here in this boat were not novices. These were accomplished sailors. If it's one thing they knew, it was how to pilot a, a boat and how to fish. That's what they did before they got into the ministry with Jesus, all right, and became his help's ministry. So they're out there in the middle of the sea. They're tossed through waves. The wind was contrary. And on the fourth watch of the night, and that's about 3 to 5 in the morning. So that's pretty early in the morning. It's still dark, kind of misty. And so about that time, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Now, I'm going to go to the Amplified <laughs> so you can see that they were a little more than just troubled. <laughs> Again, the King James is just so flowery and just, you know, makes it so so lovely when it talks about that. But uh, let me read starting verse 25. In the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m. in the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. <laughs> They're more just troubled, okay? They were terrified. They said, it is a ghost, and they screamed out with fright. Now, let me ask you something here. What do we know about fear and faith? They are reciprocals, okay? Now, a reciprocal is a fancy mathematical term that just means if you take a number line and you start at zero and you go to the right-hand side, you're going to go positively one, two, three, four, five, six. If you go from zero to the negative side, the other direction, you're going to go minus one, minus two, minus three. Now, both are lines of numbers. Both start at zero, but they go in opposite directions. Okay? So it's the same kind of thing, but it's opposite. Fear and faith are that way. Faith is a positive force for good in the believer's life. It is from God. Fear is a negative force in the believer's life. It is from the devil. Okay? So fear and faith. Now, here's what you need to know about fear and faith. You can't be in faith if you're in fear. You can't be in fear if you're in faith. It's a reciprocal. Now, the word that is translated repent means to turn and go a different direction. So if you're walking in a direction of faith, and you turn and go in the other direction, you're in fear. If I'm in fear and I turn from fear, I'm walking in the direction of faith. You say, Dr. Bill, why are you driving that point home? Well, we're going to find out. Let's look at what it says here. They were terrified. So what were they in? They were in fear. So they could not be in faith. Amen? So they're in fear. They said it's a ghost. They screamed out with fright. So again, 
there in fear. But instantly he spoke to them saying what? Take courage. I am. Notice how he said that. I am. Stop being afraid. Now, boy, there is a lot of teaching right here. <laughs> take courage. You take courage. You don't just kind of eh, ease into courage. You know, it's not a passive thing to be courageous. Okay, you have to take courage. I like what Gloria Copeland says about taking your healing. You have to seize it. It's like an opportunity. You seize the opportunity. You take courage. Well, that's exactly what God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. He said to him, be strong and very courageous. Okay? He knew what Joshua was up against. And so what he told him, what he encouraged him to do was be strong and take courage. Same thing here that Jesus told the disciples. They're out there in the boat. They're about to drown. It is a storm. They are in serious trouble. Jesus is walking on the water. What does he yell out to them? Okay, boys, don't worry, I'm here. That's not what he said, was it? He said, take courage. Seize courage. Don't walk in a direction of fear. Walk in a direction of faith. Then he reminded them of something. I am. Now they, as good Jews, they knew the story of Moses and the burning bush. They were very familiar with the fact that when Moses was standing there before the burning bush and he's kind of fumbling around, I don't know if I want to take, you know, my place and do what I'm supposed to do, you know, so Lord, what, who shall I say sent me? Because, you know, the Jews, even though they worshiped the true and the living God, they didn't know his name. So God told Moses, tell them, I am, that I am has sent you. So he gave them the, his name in its essence, yod heh vah in the Hebrew, or as some translate it, Yahweh. All right? The Hebrew word that is, I am. So what does Jesus tell them? I am. He's reminding them, I am God. I'm here. Okay, he's reminding them who they are to have faith in. So he says, take courage. I am. Stop being afraid. Now, notice he doesn't say, you know, you guys really ought to consider operating in faith instead of fear. You know, it's casual suggestion. No, it's a, it's a command. It's an order. Stop. Why did he say it so abruptly? Why did he say it so in such an immediate way. They're about to drown. They're in a harsh situation. They're in a situation that that boat's going to turn over, they're going to drown in the sea in the middle of this storm. And they were so afraid of it, they knew the trouble they were in. Because again, they had natural knowledge of storms, wind, the sea, and boats. They knew the trouble they were in. So he says, stop. Arrest fear. Stop fear. Now, this applies to us today. If we're in a situation that we're in trouble, and maybe we don't see the way out, and we just kind of, you know, well, I'm in faith, Brother Bill. I, I'm doing the best I can. You need to stop. You need to arrest that. You need to take courage. You need to get aggressive. See, we've been too passive. We think... And this is the world, the way the world teaches about Christianity. Christians are supposed to be passive. We're supposed to just be kind of namby-pamby, you know. <laughs> no. We've never been that way. <laughs> you look in the Bible, Jesus didn't go into the temple and kind of ask the money changers, guys, uh, can you maybe leave? Did he do that? No. He picked up a whip and ran them out. <laughs> in love. Amen. He did do it in love, but love isn't always ooey-gooey, syrupy. Sometimes love is pick up the whip. Well, same thing. We take courage. We stop being afraid. We move aggressively to do what we're supposed to do. All right, now let's look at what happens with Peter. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you. Well, now what's Jesus going to do? Well, Peter, wait, it's, it's not me. <laughs> No, 
You know, Jesus, see, here's, this is something you really need to understand about Jesus. Jesus is the one that said, let your yay be nay and your, your, uh, your yay be yay and your nay be nay. In other words, yes and no. All right? You're supposed to only say what it is you believe, what it is you are desiring to say, not be wishy-washy, namby-pamby, beat around the bush. So when, when Peter said, if it's you, bid me come, Jesus said, come. In other words, it's me. <laughs> what else am I going to say? You put me in a box here, Peter. Come. Now, here's the thing about Peter. Bless his darling heart. People read this and they say, Peter, you know, man, he got out there and sank. First he walked on the water. I mean, until you walk on the water, don't give Peter a hard time. <laughs> he at least got out of the boat. Now that's what I'm talking about here today. you got to get out of the boat. See, Jesus comes across the water and you see him come and you go, Woo, look at Jesus. Oh, wow. He's walking on the water. Isn't that neat? How many of us go, Ooh, I think I'll join him. Hey, Jesus, tell me to come. And then he says, come. Well, now, here's the thing about walking on the water. Don't just go out and walk on the water for the fun of it. You don't have a word. <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that says all believers can walk on the water anytime they want to. He had a word. He asked Jesus, let me come. Jesus said, come. He had the word come to walk on. One little word from Jesus. But it was enough for Peter to get out of the boat. See, a lot of people looking for a dissertation. God sometimes just says, come. Okay? And you got to step out on that one word. Matter of fact, just between you and me and the wall, that's usually the way God works. When he asks you to deliver something in a particular meeting, maybe he says, give out a message in tongues or, or uh, give a word of interpretation or whatever, very often you'll just get a phrase, just a little word or maybe a little direction. And you got to step out of the boat before you get the rest of it. you got to open your mouth and start giving it. And I've been in situations like that where the Lord would say, Say this. And I'd be at a meeting and I'd stand up. All I'd have was the first phrase. And as soon as I'd say it, a lot more would come. And I'd go, Ooh, hallelujah. You know? But I had to get out of the boat. I had to step out in faith. And that's what getting out of the boat here is talking about. So here's Peter. Now, what do we know about Peter then in this case? Since Jesus said, take courage, I am, stop being afraid. What did Peter do? He took courage. He stopped being afraid. How do I know that? Because he walked on the water. He actually walked on the water. He took steps of faith. He got out of the boat. Okay? Let's see if that's not so. He said, come. Peter got out of the boat, and Peter walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. Well, that tells me he not only got out of the boat, stepped on the water, and began to walk, he came toward Jesus. He apparently walked a good little ways, because Jesus was still out from the boat, so he's walking. So apparently Peter was doing pretty well, okay? So again, he had to be in faith. He was not in fear when he started, but then look what happens. This is the point people always center up on, <laughs> is his failure. First, you've got to see his success. Then let's analyze the failure. But when Peter perceived and felt, he perceived and he felt. What's that? That's the five physical senses. Now, folks, if you're operating in faith, you cannot trust your five physical senses, what you see, what you hear. All of those senses will mislead you because they're in the natural realm. Now, most of the time, you've got to trust your senses. If I'm about to cross the road and I see a truck coming, I should not walk out in front of the truck. Okay? That's called wisdom. <laughs> So most of the time, I've got to trust my physical senses. Yes, but when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to faith, my senses, my natural senses, have to take the back seat 
and my spiritual sensibilities have to take the front seat. You see what I'm saying? So here's Peter. He perceives the strong wind. He feels the strong wind. And he was what? Frightened. Well, what do we know about reciprocals? If he's frightened, he's in fear. If he's frightened, that means he's no longer in faith. He's now switched direction from faith to fear. What happens? He began to sink. Now, I think it's important to point out here, he began to sink. He didn't just go, bloop, and he's gone. Now, how did, you know, wait a minute here, Dr. Bill, how do you know he didn't just sink? Because he began to sink and he cried out. If he just sank, he'd have gone, bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> you know? He cried out, which means his head was still above water. Now, I don't know how much of him was out of the water, <laughs> but I can kind of see him beginning to sink by his ankles going below the water, and then maybe his shins, and then his knees. You see what I'm saying? There's still a good part of him out of the water, enough that he could cry out to Jesus. Praise the Lord that he did. But he cries out to Jesus, so he's just beginning. He has not got fully wet yet. <laughs> okay? So he cries out, Lord, save me, the Amplified says, from death. They add that little amplification that he was serious about this. <laughs> he believed he was about to die. So he says, Lord, save me from death. Now notice verse 31. Ooh, hallelujah. Notice verse 31. Instantly. Don't you love that? He cries out to the Lord and instantly. The Lord didn't say, all right, Peter, uh, give me a few minutes here. <laughs> I'll be back to you next week. So your people can talk to my people. No, no, no. Instantly, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him, and held him. I love that. See, he caught him, but then he held him. See, that implies to me he had a hold of him tightly. He held him close. Jesus wasn't going to let him go into the water and drown. Same thing with God. God is for you. He is never against you. He wants to help you. Just cry out to him, praise God, and instantly he will be there. And he'll not only grab a hold of you, he'll hold you. He's not going to let go. See, I like that, praise God. He reached out his hand, he caught him, he held him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith. Well, now, you know, I hadn't really ever walked on the water. But uh, if I did ever walk on the water, I'd probably be going, I have great faith. Well, guess what? Peter did it with little we know because Jesus quantifies it. He says, oh, you of little faith. Why did you reverse yourself from a direction of faith? I hope you enjoyed that. I trust you did. We'll pick up next week with the second half of that message. And until then, you can write us here at Word of Faith Ministries, our address, Word of Faith Ministries, P.O. Box 5213, High Point, North Carolina, the zip code 27262. And of course, as always, you can write me at my email address, which is drbill, D-R-B-I-L-L, -L, at W-O-F-M dot O-R-G. Write us. I want to hear from you. I want to hear how this uh, broadcast and netcast is reaching you and, and, and how you're enjoying it. And particularly when we do what we did today with bringing a live service to you, let me know how that ministers to you as well. And join us next time. Remember, until then, to fulfill the Word of God. The Word of Faith Netcast is brought to you by Word of Faith Ministries and our partners around the world.